I've probably said far too much already. If I say any more, other teams will start looking at this video, which I don't want. <laughs> we also have to manage to take the energy we put into the air. So the energy we put into the air, we have a three megawatt fan. If you're driving at full speed, those three megawatts effectively generate motion. motion. You call it Brownian motion. It generates excitement between the, the molecules in the, in the airline and those, those, that energy becomes heat. So we heat the air up as we drive it forward. We have to take that, that heat out of the, our airline. So in our facility, in one of our legs, we have uh, a huge, really huge radiator. It's about nine meters by nine meters in size. Um, we pump water, cool water, through that radiator as fast as we can pump it and we regulate the temperature of the water. So we send the air through a radiator. This has an additional benefit. Swirling air will pass into a radiator. Once it passes out the other side, you can no, no longer have, if you like, a big macroscopic swirling of the air. You stop that swirl send it through the radiator, we then send it through a couple of corners and towards the working section. Now in each corner we have turning vanes. You can think of them as a baffle, but what I would call them a turning vane. So in each corner there are a number of aerofoil shaped or curved um, uh, devices that help the air to make the corner with the minimum aerodynamic loss of energy. And we have those in every corner. Uh, without it, uh, you just waste a great deal of energy. So this is something that, that uh, early wind tunnels for over 100 years have, uh, have used. When we get round to the last leg before we have the working section, we have what is called a settling chamber. And as the air passes into the settling chamber, we, we expand it reasonably quickly. We then have a blockage caused by, some, in some wind tunnels it's the radiator, uh, but we have a radiator and then separated from that a honeycomb and the honeycomb is aligned so that uh, you just see the edge of the material in the direction of airflow but any remaining swirl in the air is almost entirely eliminated by passing through a rather long a series of effectively rather long thin tubes so that the air, if it's swirling in, the, in, the working sec in approaching the working section, that swirl is eliminated. So that's the purpose of having a honeycomb. And then after the honeycomb, we have a number of flywire screens, you can think of them as basically a, a fine wire mesh, but, but in, uh, in tropical countries you'd use them uh, as a, a screen to prevent insects coming in. I grew up in Australia, so it's a flywire screen to me. Uh, and uh, these, these screens take any remaining large areas of turbulence, it's becoming smaller because it's passed through the honeycomb, they take that and they break it up into even smaller uh, turbulence. And then we have what we call a contraction, uh, a bell mouth, a contraction. It takes the air and compresses it to a smaller size and we can't create or remove air, so it has to speed up as it approaches the working section. One of the things this does is it takes the remaining tiny little bits of turbulence that are still there after passing through your wire mesh or your wire meshes because we have quite a number uh, takes that remaining turbulence and breaks it down into even smaller turbulence because it, it's, it, it might be a few millimetres but by the time you compress the air we have a quite a, a decent contraction ratio and by the time you compress the air to something even, even faster and smaller, uh, more together, then that, that turbulence is reduced even further. And these are tricks that you use in a wind tunnel to keep control over the turbulence level. Now that doesn't mean you don't want to, in certain circumstances, add turbulence back into the air, but that's something we can manage. I'm giving the game away now, I'm going to ruin the future of aerodynamics. <laughs>